Is this the first time you've seen an aquascape being made? Yeah. Yeah? Do you like it? Yeah. That's beautiful, well done. And when you look at this aquarium from now on, you can tell your mum and dad that you did this bit. It's probably the best bit in the whole aquarium. Hi everyone, welcome to this new video where I am going to aquascape this amazing Awaze Scaper Line 90 for my new friend Lawrence. Lawrence reached out to me and here we are now. It's a really great 90 centimetre system. Everything's absolutely brand new. I'll take you through all the equipment. Obviously we'll do the whole scaping process as well. So it's a really full in-depth tutorial today. Very excited for it. I'm sure Lawrence and his family are gonna enjoy this beautiful aquascape in the long term. Got some amazing materials. Thanks to Aquarium Gardens for their support. Loads of great aquarium plants, mostly Tropica, some beautiful hardscape, substrate materials, classic nature aquarium style, as you would expect from me, of course. Let's run through the equipment before we start scaping. Starting from the top, the lighting is the Twinstar 900S version three. It's got a powerful light, 84 watts, with a color temperature of 6,500 Kelvin. And as individually colored diodes so you get this really nice mixture really good rendition especially for the reds and the greens quite a natural looking light as you can see quite a lot of red and the green diodes there to give you a really lovely color saturation but not as much as say something like the ada solar rgb which you could argue looks a little bit too hyper real the aquarium itself is an Oase scaper line 90 measuring 90 centimeters by 45 by 45 which is three foot by 18 inches by 18 inches, giving us a volume of around 200 litres or so, about 50 US gallons. Quite unique and it has mitered corners, so they meet together at a 45 degree angle rather than perpendicular. Very minimum silicon work, so that sets it apart from some other competitor brands. For instance, the Aquascaper range now has much kind of thicker silicon, uh, which in my mind doesn't represent such high quality. It has a very nice discreet kind of etching of the Oase logo on the side of the tank so it's not distracting you by these uh, relatively cheap stickers that you can see on the front of some aquariums. It's 8 mil glass so it's a little bit thinner than sometimes you can get 10 mil glass. I actually like it a little bit thinner because it's actually going to give you more transparency. The thicker the glass the more um, transparency you lose. Low iron glass, of course, giving you this nice blue tinge, which represents the low iron. If you think about a regular float glass aquarium with a darker green, you're actually not getting so much transparency. In terms of the filtration, we have the Awaze Biomaster 850 Thermo. So it's the biggest filter that we can, we can get in here. Uh, we opted for that because we wanted more flow which is going to give us more chance of uh, getting that CO2 around the tank. It is a high-tech setup, so we want to give the plants the best chance possible. It's the standard media that comes with the Oase filters, but we have added Seekem Purigen just to give us that nicely polished water to start with. The wood's probably going to leach some tannins. We'll talk more about the wood later, so that's helpful. We've got clear hoses. Oase come supplied with like grey smoky hoses but we've uh, upgraded those to the clear hoses, which then match perfectly with our glassware here, 16 millimeter outlet lily pipe and the inlet here. And I've deliberately put the outlet at the front of the aquarium and the inlet at the rear. And this is gonna create a nice gyre effect of a flow circulation pattern to hopefully keep all those plants uh, well fed with the CO2, etc. Uh, we have a CO2 drop checker as well fitted already. And this, I've deliberately placed this under the lily pipe and my, my logic behind that was this is probably the least area of flow that we're going to get in the aquarium. So if we're getting the CO2 measured there, we're gonna guarantee that the CO2 around the remainder of the aquarium is going to be higher or at least more efficient circulation than there. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Going inside the cabinet again, on the right hand side, we have the pressurized CO2 system with an inline diffuser. I've lent Lawrence my GLA kind of high spec regulator here. We are going to change that to a stride raise regulator when some comes in stock at Aquarium Gardens. 
The cabinet itself is the matte grey finish, very trendy, very modern looking and suits Lawrence's family's home beautifully. It's a, it's a beautiful home and I think this aquarium really fits in well to his living space. Uh, Lawrence has a background in interior design and clearly has good taste. Some other really cool features about the cabinet, it does have these magnetic tool holders here which we're using already. The Biomaster is fitted to a slideable drawer here, which makes maintaining the pre-filter super easy, like so. I've given Lawrence a full demonstration on that already. And then we have our Twinstar um, controller here, which I've never used before, very easy. You can preset six, eight or 10 hour photo period. You can change the dimmer settings as well, and you can just turn it on and off. So really simple to use. I'm really impressed with that actually. Everything's just really neat and tidy, very high quality. Uh, I forgot to talk about the slots, the removable kind of slots that you can take out and add to configure to your hose configuration as required. So this side is a, is a full slot, of course. And then on the right hand side, we've got two small gaps there for the two hoses. So the whole system works beautifully together as a coherent piece of, not just an aquarium, but it's a piece of interior design. It's not a cheap system. You know, I was here at the higher end of the price point for the, for the rimless market. But in my mind, you know, if you have the financial kind of freedom to invest in something like this, it's definitely worth considering getting the higher quality stuff. The finish is just much better. And it's all about the details matter, you know, individual detail on its own might not be noticeable but when you add them all together it really does make a big difference and when you're living with an aquarium day in day out Lawrence works from home a lot he's going to want to enjoy this aquarium as much as he can and hence why he's invested so well in the system itself and also in me speaking of which if you do want me to escape for you get in touch you can go on my website hit the contact button and uh, shoot me a message and we'll uh, have a conversation so we'll start scaping now, very exciting. Okay, so now it's time for the most interesting part of the video, maybe, the hard scaping process. So a few weeks ago, I met up with Lawrence and we went to Aquarium Gardens together. Uh, we come up with the aquascape design, the hardscape and the planting plan. Took some photos and things just to make sure I could remember for today. Lawrence has kindly pre-soaked all of the wood. It has leached a load of tannins already uh, the biggest piece is here. What I'm going to do is actually put it in the aquarium first, glue it in position just to make sure it doesn't float because it is bobbing around a little bit even though it has been pre-soaked. We also have the Seekem Purigen which is going to help with tannins and also Lawrence will be doing large frequent water changes for the first few weeks. So this is the wood. We've got three pieces all together and then we've got some beautiful dark mini landscape rock I think it's called or dark Siriu uh, pieces like this so I'll crack on with that now and then I'll talk about the substrate system so the hardscaping process is arguably the most important part of your aquascape so it's really worth investing in the right materials and taking your time to create the layout to the best of your ability so I was very lucky to find these beautiful pieces already in aquarium gardens. So I've got a photo just in front of me here on my phone, just to use as a quick reference. And we can always have little minor adjustments later on. So that's the main piece. And as you can see, the main kind of focal point bit here, which is the piece sticking out here, is roughly about two thirds of the way along, or one third this way. And that's really good for kind of creating a very uh, pleasing aesthetic balance. The rule of thirds, we call that. So we are dealing with glass here. With the lily pipe's already installed. So we just need to be mindful of not knocking those. Obviously glass is brittle. That's nice there. So we've got lots of epiphyte plants to use. So that will kind of hide any perceived imperfections where the wood doesn't look so natural together. So where the wood's joined will more than likely be adding epiphytes. I think we need to lean that across a bit more. This piece here before was too vertical so we're going across at an angle there now. It's touching the the base of the glass at the back so we can glue that potentially when we're ready. So now I'm mindful of the, the rocks. We need enough space around the base of the wood for the rocks 
It's a very, very hardscape dominant layout, this, which I think is what oh, Lawrence wanted. I hope it is anyway, because it's what we've got. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's think about our rocks. So what I'm doing now is looking at the strata of the stone. That's these natural lines. And this one in particular has got some beautiful gouges here. Really, really uh, high impact texturing going on. We've got the white veins. We've got that contrasting with the dark gray. We've got these big gouges and it just makes the, the hardscape material look even more interesting. If you think about a smooth round pebble, big kind of boulder, smooth, you know, symmetrical, it's not going to look so interesting. So these are some tips maybe that you can think about yourselves when you're selecting your hardscape at home. Bearing in mind, we are going to be adding soil. So this kind of unnatural V shape here will be disguised by the substrate. Moving on to our second largest stone. Now you can quite clearly see this one here is ugly on this side. It's got lots of calcium deposits here, very flat, very kind of uniform and boring. So we need to make sure that is facing away. And by doing so, we expose this beautiful side here with again, with the white veins and the gouges, which match perfectly with our main stone here. And this lends itself already to be positioned in between these two pieces of wood, taking note of the strata, all running towards like the center of the aquarium. So it's kind of, everything is kind of harmonizing and blending. You know, conversely, if we had everything kind of flowing in the same direction, it would look a little bit, it would look a bit more kind of coherent, but maybe not so impactful. If we've got the, the strata kind of opposing each other at right angles, which we've got here, it adds a certain tension, which is usually a desirable aspect when you're creating layouts, depending on your taste, of course. And then the, what we'll do then is glue the stones to the glass and the wood to the glass. And then that's absolutely gonna anchor that no problem. And again, you'll, see, you'll note the bottom of this stone here isn't looking natural, it's not flat, but we're gonna be covering that with soil. So I'm just visualizing how it's gonna look in the short term future. Okay, again, working our way down in size and I do have some other smaller pieces of stone if we need to smash up into small pieces. In fact, what I'm gonna do I'm going to actually put these in after the substrate because we want to keep some of that height. It's going to be lost otherwise. So, but it's good practice. So what I'll do now is we use a technique. I'm not sure who invented this technique, um, but it's, I've not long started using it. I mean, it's been around for a few years now, but what we use is uh, some sort of cotton wool or uh, this is filter floss and then some super glue and you wedge the cotton wool in place where you want the attachment to be and then dob a load of glue on it. It kind of melts the, the cotton wool a bit and then it dries and, and forms a solid sort of adhesive cement type thing. So we'll do that now, we'll do the touch points all around the wood where it touches the glass and then that, you know, that will dry in 30 seconds, a minute or so. Then we'll do the substrate. The substrate is actually a really important part of this, sub, this system, this aquascape. Uh, we'll go through in uh, some more detail about that in a minute. But yeah, we'll start gluing and uh, hopefully I won't get my fingers glued together. I don't suppose you've got any rubber gloves, have you? Yes. The latex sort of disposables? Yeah. It's not that kind of video, Lawrence. <laughs> well, you're smiling at like that for. <laughs> okay, Lawrence has actually come up with a really good point that in order to, what we ideally need to do is bring that main piece back a good inch or so, about four centimetres, three or four centimetres. We can achieve that by just cutting off directly kind of downwards. We can shift everything back. So we'll take the light off, take all the hardscape out, kind of start again. That's okay. You know, we're here for the long time, not a good time. <laughs> We've already had a good time in the Porsche 911. Okie dokie, we've sawed off the edge as per Lawrence's excellent suggestion. We also have noticed that the outlet of the filter, the lily pipe, is going to blow directly onto this piece of wood here. So we will move that uh, appropriately at the end, either right the way forward or probably blowing around the centre actually. And then maybe 
move the lily pipe, uh, the inlet accordingly. We'll just play around with that later. But what we've done, just to remind you, we've just removed sort of five centimeters or so from the back. It's allowed, it's actually changed the composition quite considerably, but in a better way. So this is, this is more of an angle now coming this way. It lends itself to this one kind of being perpendicular with this one here. And then the third piece of wood here, it's coming down in a really interesting formation to almost reflect this one here. The largest main stone here with the beautiful strata this way and then the strata of this one running this way. So again, we've got that per perfect right angle concept. Okay, we've been fiddling around and we've come up with the basic composition now. It's time to add our substrate. So in order to feed the plant roots, we've got a combination of the power sand from ADA and then we're going to be used Tropica Aquarium Soil. But we also have a really beautiful range of cosmetic gravels as well, starting off with a very fine natural sand and going up to a larger grain of a similar colour, sort of greys and whites, slight light, light browns. And then an even bigger grain, this is the ADA Aqua Gravel, which is basically a bigger version of the other one. And then we also have some smaller stones to add. And then it'll be time for planting. So it's a really dynamic and strong hardscape. The interesting thing with this process is it is going to be viewed from various angles in the living space. So although it looks earlier perfect from dead on, if you looked at it from this side, which is where some of the living spaces from where the, some of the sofas are, it looked a little, this piece of wood in particular looks a little bit odd. So. Lawrence and I came up with a kind of balance in acts really to make it look good from the front and as good as possible from the left as well. The good news is you don't have to achieve perfection at this stage because as you add the plants, the substrate and the water, it all changes regardless. So what you think looks perfect now is going to look really different once you've got all those other processes on top. So don't worry so much if it isn't that kind of your idea of perfection, but do spend some time and effort and energy trying to get it to look as good as possible. So first I'm going to add the power sand. This goes as the base layer. It contains lots of nutrients, but also uh, bacteria. So beneficial bacteria, because substrate actually needs bacteria to help convert the nutrients in, in an available form to the plant roots. So I'm going to kind of carefully add it towards the back right. That's where the majority of the root feeding plants will be. Top of the power stand, we're going to put some Tropica Aquarium soil. This provides a host of nutrients for the plant roots, also reduces the water pH and hardness slightly, making it more suitable for fish and shrimp. It doesn't need anything added to it, doesn't need rinsing. It's a great all round product. Use this in over 100 aquascapes over the years. Absolute proven performer. But I am giving Lawrence some nutri nutrition capsules so he can add those later on to target feed any, any plants that need extra nutrition to the roots. So we'll get that in there now. Going to cover a similar kind of area over the power sand. And then what I'm going to do is more than likely some of the soil will run into the open area around here, which I don't want it to do. We can move that back and then we'll go around with that kind of boundary with our cosmetic sands. And then it'll be time to plant. Uh, just a quick shout out to Abby for helping me with the soil. You'll see her later doing some planting. Happy with that, Abby? Yeah. Yeah, well done. So you, I put the majority of the soil in now, created like a barrier sort of boundary effect. You can see where the open area is versus the soil. Now what I'm going to do is put the finest grain sand over the top of the open area and then we'll gradually build up in grain sizes and then finally we'll add our rocks to really make a distinct boundary between the cosmetic sand and the soil and then potentially add even more soil to create some more depth to ensure easy planting. So next step is the sand. This is Hugo Kamishi. This is called quartz white five kilogram five kilogram obviously the weight but just quart, quartz white it's relatively clean won't need rinsing add that pretty much straight away 
thin layer. It doesn't need to be thick because we're not really going to plant into it. Maybe plant some small sprigs of Eleocharis just to add as little accents. Okay, so we've got our other smaller stones to go in now. And the idea is to create a natural kind of barrier between the sand and the soil. And then we'll add our larger grains of sand after that. So we'll start off with the largest, most distinctive piece here. And the top tip, you can actually just slightly raise the sand up to the edge of the stone and it just makes it look a lot more natural, like, like the earth's eroded away and exposed that stone. Okay, next biggest size. Now, I've got some pieces that have been in my garden for a while, so they will look a little bit different right now at the moment in terms of their colour and texture but over the coming weeks, they'll all kind of equalize and look really natural. So now I'm going to put the largest grain up against the stones. So it's going to, what's going to happen is you get the big stone, then we'll get the big gravel, and then we'll go medium gravel, and then you'll see the fine gravel. And this is what happens in nature. We don't see really, really fine sand and then suddenly big giant rocks. There's normally a transition between the grain sizes. So that's what we're trying to do today, to create the most natural kind of look as possible. So we'll open that bag. I think Abigail's going to help me again. Is this the first time you've seen the aquascape being made? Yeah. Yeah? Do you like it? Yeah. If you sprinkle that near the rocks for me, in front of them, that's it. Perfect. You can tell your friends about this at school. Do you think your school would like an aquarium like this in there? in your reception area, you know where people come to visit? Yeah, yeah. I'd love to be able to go to all different schools around the country and set aquariums up for them and teach, I think it teaches children a lot of really good things like how to look after an aquarium, how they work, how to grow plants, how to look after animals. What we can do is sort of deliberately mix the gravels with the sand. You know, like when you're at the beach and you, um, you see the water going in and out in the tide. It's kind of that effect. What happens is uh, over many, many years, that water gradually erodes away the stones and, and leaves you like different sizes. So we're almost trying to sort of pretend that we're, we're looking at a landscape rather than underwater. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's quite interesting to combine the, the different things. And the idea is when you're looking at it, you know, when, when it's all done and all the plants are in there, everything, all the water's in there and the shrimp and the fish, and then it's just hopefully a really lovely thing to you to look at, you know, and just relax when you're looking at it. Because it, for me, it just helps me feel very relaxed. And that's why I do, what, that's why I do this job, really, because it helps relax me. Have you got an idea what job you want to do? You want to be a marine biologist? So this is really interesting for you then, watching this, I guess. It's a little bit like marine, although this is fresh water. You know, marine biology is, is salt water, yeah? What's your favourite salt water animal or fish? Do you, you love seahorses? Well, they love to live in sea grasses, don't they? Have you seen? Like seaweed, yeah. They wrap their tails around, don't they, to keep them secure, yeah, yeah. And is it the male seahorse actually carries the babies? Is that right? Yeah. I yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. They're very they're actually quite you can keep them in an aquarium, but actually quite difficult to look after. Have you ever have you have you looked into that before? Have you have you asked Daddy? Okay, so we've got our biggest grain and our smallest grain. Now it's time for our medium sized grain. This is just gonna really enhance the overall look. And again, it's all about details in this hobby. And then there'll be Plenty of this left over for Lawrence to use in the long term because it will get, you know, sometimes it will get a little bit covered in algae or just start to look a bit kind of ugly. Depending on your taste, you can always siphon off any old stuff and then replace it with the new. You could even wash the old stuff again and then recycle it. But this, you know, it's, it's not expensive. This great, even the ADA, this is only eight pounds for a bag, which for an ADA product is actually quite cheap. You can even sprinkle a, a few of the grains on the rocks just to make it look even more a bit natural, just to blend that in. 
It's really funny. Whenever I do a client scape and I always like really like it, I always get a bit jealous. Like, oh, why don't I do that to my own tanks at home? Why don't they look that good? <laughs> Abigail's going to put a piece in for us now. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll give you some gravel and you can just place it around the stone. And now, do you remember what we talked about earlier about sort of moving the sand up, up towards the stone? Perfect. That's beautiful. Well done. And when you look at this aquarium from now on, you can tell your mum and dad that you did this bit. It's probably the best bit in the whole aquarium. And the yeah. final piece. Do you want to do the last bit? I'll let you choose where to put it. Learn, if you think about everything that you've just learnt about. And that is exactly what I was going to do. Perfect. Doesn't it look amazing? Does it look really natural now to you? Yeah. Okay, that's the hardscape complete. Special thanks to my new friend, Abby, for putting those amazing pieces of rock in and the graded gravels, I think. She enjoyed it and learnt loads as well. I think it looks great. Lawrence really likes it. Abby likes it. Kay likes it. I like it. Hopefully you like it at home. And it's, so, it's such a bold hardscape, you know, got really kind of high impact woods. You know, not too many fine textures, which we often find in aquascaping these days. I quite like to use bold, kind of thick textured wood, but it's got all these kind of intricate kind of holes and grains where we can attach our epiphyte plants later. I think for me the highlight at the moment is the is the graded gravels and the use of the the dark Syriu stone. I've actually brought some some stones in from home as well but I think they mix up really well and it's really natural. Over the months the, the graded gravel can be can be siphoned away and replaced if necessary or just siphoned and washed and, and put back again. I actually like to see a little bit of kind of algae and detritus build up, you know, kind of these organics. It just makes it look a little bit more natural. So next we'll plant. I've got a really big, beautiful selection of plants. I'll go and grab those now. We'll have a little kind of look through what we've got. Uh, very kindly donated some mature trident fern and area cal on Vietnam from Dave from McGarry Aquarium Gardens. And we've got lots of one, two grow species. We've got Cryptochrony nurii, Staragyni, uh, mini hair grass, crypt green, Wendy Chai green, Abuca philandras, Hygrophila 53b from Tropica, uh, some Monte Carlo, and then we've got a load of stem plants. We've got some Rotala rotundifolia, which is the regular rotundifolia, which will go kind of a pinky, pinky orange if we're lucky. Then we've got Libigia super red, which will definitely go red, Anubius petite. So loads of different species. We'll prepare those now and I'll give you some more details about the plants themselves uh, once we've start planting. So we've, of course, done the ADO power sand and the Tropica aquarium soil in the background. That's behind all of the, of the rock work. So we are gonna plant very densely. We've got probably 40 or 50 pots or so. So gonna be really densely planted. It's gonna look amazing right from the get go. And I can imagine in just a couple of weeks, it's just going to look amazing. They've got fast growing stem plants. They're going to fill up the background. They've got mature epiphytes already. Okay, so we've prepared all of the plants. Special shout out again to my helpers, Lawrence and Abby. Learnt loads. What was your favourite plant, Abby? Monte Carlo. So let's talk about that first, shall we? So we've got some Monte Carlo. This is the potted variety. And this is going to grow as a kind of an epiphyte. So the idea is to wedge it in between some of the cracks in the rocks. And that is going to look beautiful, kind of just draping over forward into the foreground. We can split that up into a couple more portions just to make it spread out a bit more. So we'll start off with the foreground species while we're here. We've got uh, just one pot of uh, Eleocaris mini, otherwise known as mini hair grass. I'm going to plant just tiny sprigs of that just around the, the sand near the rocks again, just to act as like a transition and just to add a kind of a nice texture. Uh, and then back from that, we've got the Staragyni. Uh, grows as a dense, compact bush, responds really well to trimming. And then we have some Aereo Kowlon Vietnam. This is mature specimens from uh, Dave Pierce's Iwagumi at Aquarium Gardens. Absolutely stunning aquarium. If you ever get the chance to go to Aquarium Gardens, strongly recommend it. I only live five kilometers away. You never know, I might see you in there. Say hello. And then we have some epiphyte plants. We've got Buca Philandrothea, 
which will grow as an epiphyte uh, attached to the wood or, and or rocks. It tends to do, do well in the shade and, and, in, and in higher light. So it will go probably above the Anubius, which we've got here, Anubius Petite. That tends to do well in the shade. So that will definitely go lower down in the water column, shaded by uh, upper plants, the higher plants. So that's the foreground, midground, um, foreground and epiphyte plants talked about. Now we're going into some background plants and midground plants. Uh, starting right from the back, we've got Hygrophila cyamensis, sorry, Hygrophila coriambosa cyamensis 53b, one of my favourite plant names of all time. You could just say 53b, I'd be if you get a bit confused. Can you remember 53b? It wasn't um, Herbie 53 in uh, Herbie, you know, the Beetle? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, there you go. So that's easy to. Have you ever seen any of your Herbie films? Dad made you watch them? I used to love them. Herbie Goes Bananas. Yeah. Uh, we have Rotala Rotundifolia, classic, easy background stem. It'll be interesting to see what colour it changes to uh, under the good lighting that we've got here with the Twin Star. It's called Rotundifolia because you'll see the leaves are very distinctly round. Interestingly, once it adapts to its underwater growth form, this has been grown hydroponically out of water. Once it adapts to grow underwater, it grows a much more needle-like colour and it will change colour from this bright green to essentially a pinky, orange, red, purple, depending on the light, depending on the nutrient conditions, etc. Um, the 53B, by the way, is one of the fastest growing stems once it's adapted. It will really fill out the background quite quickly. Uh, the leaves will actually get more compact, probably, and a more kind of dense appearance once it does adapt. It responds really well to trimming. So what I did encourage uh, Lawrence to do is as soon as the plants kind of reach the surface, he can trim them right back. And then wherever he trims from, it's going to grow two new shoots. So it'll create this really kind of uh, dense bushy appearance. The kind of main focal point plant in terms of colour is the Ludwigia super red here. It's a very easy plant and it tends to grow red even in low light and non-CO2 conditions. So it's a real good good plant for to suit most aquariums if you want something red. Very fast grower as well and it does send out lots of side shoots so you can create a very kind of dense mass really quickly. And then we've got a couple of species of crypt. Uh, we've got Cryptocoryne wendertii green. This is in the one to grow, so it's very small at the moment, as you can see, but that will grow to 15 centimetres, 20 centimetres tall. So that's perfect mid-ground plants to go behind the Staragyne, I would suggest. And then we've got the Cryptocoryne nurii, which is a new species available from Tropica, and it has a beautiful um, leaf colour, and it has these really interesting patterns. So it's Normally it's a mixture of kind of red and green and it has like these V formations running along the, along the leaves. So it's really beautiful. So we'll plant those now. I will start, our, oh, nearly forgot. The piece on the resistance, as they say in France. I don't know why I just spoke French then. I don't even know French, but it sounded good. Wunderbar, German, wonderful, uh, beautiful. Magnificent, awesome. Uh, trident fern, one of my favourite plants of all time. Microsorum terribus trident. It's a classic focal point plant. Um, kindly again donated by Dave from Aquarium Gardens. And yeah, very grateful for his support on many of my aquascaping projects. And if you are interested in the aquascaping for you, go on my website, hit the contact button and uh, Maybe you can have a beautiful aquascape like this in your home. What do you think, Abby? Do you think most people would like a beautiful aquascape like this in their home? Yeah, I do. So when I'm planting Monte Carlo like this, I tend to go for the uh, potted version rather than the one to grow. It tends to respond better uh, when you're growing it as an epiphyte rather than the one to grow is preferred to be planted in the soil in my experience. Some people like to plant into the soil with it being wet, but I prefer it to plant into it dry. It tends to keep the plant sort of anchored better and you don't get so much kind of uh, mess, you know, messy soil transported around the aquarium. 
So when I'm, when I'm thinking about where to put the plants, I'm just kind of using intuition rather than like really formulating a strong plan. I don't really kind of over plan my, my scapes. If, if you're a beginner, planning is probably going to be advantageous. Um, and actually there's nothing wrong with copying either. You know, if you see a scape that you really like, um, a lot of people are kind of put off by copying. I think it's a bit, I don't know, cheating. But in my mind, it's, you know, if you've got, if you like, if you've got something you like the look of, and you kind of, and you, you know how they've created that thing, then why not copy it or at least use it as inspiration? So nothing wrong with copying. I've had, you know, many people, you know, kind of copy or use my scapes as inspiration and I find it, um, I find it a flattering. Create things that we live with that gives us peace, you know, and joy. It doesn't really matter how you get there, as long as you're not harming anyone or anything, any animals in the process. So many different ways to achieve success in this hobby, and I think that's a really good thing. I think what the, the potential issue is actually there's so many different ways to create success. It can be a little bit confusing, because especially with the internet, there's so many different sort of sources of information now. What I, do is re what I would do is recommend the UK Aquatic Plant Society, UCAPS. I was one of the founders in 2007, and there's a really active forum on there. It's just a really good source of information. So rather than going on Facebook and it's kind of, you, you, you see what you're fed, this is more of a, um, it's a searchable database almost, you know, and you can, you know, search for any topic. There's journals where people have like, you know, created a, a, a complete kind of thread of their whole journey with their aquarium, you know, photos from right from the start all the way to seeing it through all the issues they've had, how they've overcome the issues. So we'll go into the hair grass now. This is going to just be planted amongst the foreground. I'll tell you what, Abby, you can plant the, um, the trident fern at the end. How does that sound? Yeah. So don't normally plant into plain sand if we've got soil. But it's kind of quite cool because what it's going to do is hopefully going to grow, but very, very slowly and it won't carpet so quickly. So it will just kind of be easy to maintain. Um, you know, mini hair grass, I've grown in high tech setups and it just becomes kind of like really quickly grows and smothers itself and grows on top of each other. You know, we don't really want that. We just want to kind of create these little, little accents amongst the foreground. I really like the way the, the, the kind of vertical fine texture of the hair grass blend, you know, contrasts with the round of the Monte Carlo. It's nice to have a couple of different contrasting textures next to each other sometimes, excuse me. So there's a small chance that we might get some floaters when we fill up, especially from the Monte Carlo that we've just sort of wedged in position. Uh, but what we can do is just reinsert that, no problem. And uh, eventually it will kind of, it should grow relatively, relatively well and attach itself in the coming weeks. So this is just one pot of the hair grass that we've got here and you can see how great the coverage is. And that's one of the main advantages to the one, two grow is that you do get so much quantity of plant versus a regular pot, even though they're kind of smaller. You look, you'll look at a regular pot in a shop and it will be, you know, typically a bigger plant because it's grown, you know, hydroponically out of the water, much bigger. The one, two grows are basically baby plants that are still very, very young. But because they're so young and small, you actually get more quantity in the pot. So they're actually better value for money. They're free from algae, free from snails, no pesticides. Some pots that you buy, maybe you'll find they're imported from Asia and they're sprayed with pesticides and um, that can be really harmful to shrimps. So shrimp are very, very sensitive to pests because basically they're classed as a pest, aren't they? You know, it's like an insecticide. Mm. So, you know, they're designed to basically kill shrimp. Mm. If you think about it, that's why it's really important to go for a pesticide free plant if possible. Okay, we're fully planted. We're ready to fill up with water. Uh, Lawrence has got a pump in a bucket, uh, which is going to pump water from his sink directly into here. Got a special attachment to prevent the water 
from uh, disturbing the substrate too much. I've also got my red colander. So we'll fill up and then I'll do a final piece to camera and yeah, job done almost. Okay, tanks filled. Unfortunately, as you can see, we've got cloudy water. Not sure why. As we filled, it was gin clear. Turn the filter on and then suddenly we've got this cloudy cloudiness. Um, I think it's the Purigen. We didn't rinse it first. Do let me know in the comments if you know you should rinse Purigen before you use it in a filter. So a little bit disappointed not to leave this wonderful family with a beautiful, clean, clear water tank, but it is what it is. And it's a good opportunity for me to come back and film again when the water is absolutely clear. Some of the plants will have grown. Maybe the shrimp have started breeding. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really happy with it. Uh, more importantly, the family are happy with it. It's been a lovely day. Thank you so much to Abby for helping. Sure, yeah. I leave the family now to have dinner. It's actually really late. It's quarter past eight in the evening. It's been a lovely day though. Thank you. Oh, that's been brilliant. And uh, Thank you so much. yeah, we'll probably hang out in the future. Yes. Go to some festivals and <laughs> drive fast cars and stuff like that. It'd be awesome. Okay, all right, cheerio. If you've liked the video, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't done so yet. And as always, let us know what fish would you put in here. Take care, cheerio.